Hello and welcome to episode number 24 of the Tradecraft Security Weekly Podcast. Uh, I'm your host, Bo Bullock. I'm joined today with Mike Felch. Sorry we've kind of been gone for a couple months. It's been a little while. We've been a little busy. A couple conferences here and there. We did start another podcast as well. So we promise we're going to try to do this weekly. So that's a promise. Yes. Promise Um, we'll try. We will try. (laughs) Yes, exactly. So this week's episode, uh, we're going to talk about evading network-based detection mechanisms. Uh, There's been a few assessments I've been on recently where the organizations did a really good job of detecting some basic uh, scans that I was performing or they were detecting password spraying. And we're, I'm going to talk about some ways we can kind of go about getting around some of those detection mechanisms this week and hopefully kind of provide some in- insight into things you can do as an organization to uh, detect people who are trying to evade your detection mechanisms. So first first off, uh, the internet's noisy. You, you probably know that. If you have an uh, external firewall at all, uh, you probably see random things hitting it all day long. Uh, there's just a lot of scanning going on. You have a ton of people who are just looking for random vulnerabilities all the time. Uh, but that being said, it's still not that hard to detect pretty basic scanning activity. So most attackers will default to using tools like Nmap and a basic Nmap scan is something that will get picked up by pretty much every single IPS out there, IDS out there today. They they have rules already built in to detect uh, and, and kind of um, fingerprint that specific tool. Um, something that I'm seeing a lot more of is not only just detection of Nmap as a tool, but also detection of specific types of activities like password spraying. Um, specifically, like we on every assessment we do, we typically try to password spray OWA portals or anything that's an NTLM related kind of uh, portal. And we're seeing a lot more organizations write rules to detect that um, uh, based off of just like failed login attempts um, internally. It gets easier too with web servers where you have more f- capability of implementing security controls kind of in the application level stuff too. True. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, exactly. I mean, so yeah, we're seeing not only like custom applications, but a lot of like the third party stuff that's already pre-built has a lot of like um, shunning kind of capabilities built into it now. So you might find a web portal that has, um, you know, every 10 attempts it locks you out or um, maybe not not lock you out, but like blocks your IP. And that's, that's something I've seen on a few different very well-known network devices. So what can we do to kind of evade that detection and as attackers proceed with the attacks that we want to uh, perform against the network? Um, first off, evading detection can be slow. Real attackers have all the time in the world. They can literally spend months on end sending packets every five minutes in between each other. Um, but realistically, us as pen testers, um, we don't have that much time. No. Um, we, we typically have maybe like, what, a week yeah. to, to do any engagement. Um, if we're lucky, maybe a couple weeks. And so we have to kind of like constrict our scanning activities down a lot more and try, try our best to still get around a lot of those network protections while not taking forever to do it. And always not having to rely on third-party services like Shodan, right? So right. We, we right. do use that data, but sometimes it's not as accurate as we would like, or maybe they've been um, blocked from being able to scan because they put some sort of a, a restriction in place. Absolutely. And with Shodan, we're looking at ports specifically. With um, things like password spraying, you're going to have to do that on your own, right? right? So um, even even with password spraying or any password type of attack, brute forcing, uh, you're going to be sending a lot of attempts against an organization. And a lot of times you're going to do it in a relatively short amount of time um, because you just don't have enough time in, in mm-hmm. engagement. But an attacker could spend, you know, like one login request every five minutes, like I said. Um, something to always kind of remember is that, you know, when it comes to like getting blocked as a pen tester, you can always just spin up more IPs, which we'll get into a couple tools that kind of do that here in a bit. Um, one other thing that I kind of wanted to quickly mention is uh, one thing that we don't typically uh, do on a lot of pen tests that I think could be valuable to organizations is specifically looking at detection thresholds and kind of looking at um, what is the lowest level of threshold that an organization detects you at and what is what are some things that are missing? Uh, for example, like if I just do a ping sweep across an organization, are they going to catch that? Um, if I go and uh, like like an episode one of this Tradecraft Security Weekly, um, I talked about getting public metadata or public um, or getting metadata from publicly available files 
off of web servers that an organization controls. That's a very automated kind of scan to go and grab a bunch of files. Would they kind of notice that? Um, if I go and perform a brute force attack with like thousands of attempts per minute, is that something you notice? I mean, it could be yeah. that they're missing even that high level. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I've seen it too where they'll detect the same source or same IP address connecting to multiple hosts mm-hmm. kind of across the organization. Right. Even though it's only one port, but just hitting multiple web servers that are distinctively different. Like um, like something like eyewitness. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Mm-hmm. Because now you're gonna you're gonna fingerprint each one of those with screenshots and in that process being able to pick up those. Exactly. So how do we go about evading detection? So when we're looking at externally uh, of a network, the two main things to kind of keep in mind are timing in between requests. So how, how long does it take for each request to happen? And then requests per IP. Because like, like you mentioned, a lot of times you're detecting um, a single IP against multiple hosts or a single IP sending multiple requests to a single system. Um, but the majority of the time, those detection mechanisms are looking at uh, a certain period of time. For example, they might be looking at like 100 requests in a minute or 50 requests in 30 seconds, something like that. So being able to kind of slow your scan down is first of all a must. Uh, like I said previously, like we don't normally have that much time. So another thing to kind of look at is manipulating and using as many source IPs as possible. This is something that cannot always be as easy as it sounds because it does involve spinning up a bunch of hosts, um, which, you know, if unless you own an ISP, you're going to have to use something like <laughs> like Amazon yeah. um, or another uh, VPS service. So we're going to... Go ahead. I was going to say, but the only problem with that is you still have to manage the connections to all of them and then manage the control flow from being able to do code execution across them in order mm-hmm. to get the data back. Exactly. So, yeah, it's possible, but it's not always as simple as that. Uh, right. Sounds. Um, and then the, the last thing like that I, I've found pretty good success with is packet fragmentation specifically. So whenever you fragment packets, uh, like so Nmap does this really well, which we'll talk about in a minute, um, you are literally breaking apart each packet and it's being reassembled once it gets to the host. So most network detection devices, because that, that process is so CPU intensive, don't actually do that. And it's hard to actually analyze fragmented packets. So that actually will get by a lot of IPSs. So, so some some tools um, for evasion. Um, so Nmap, first of all, we were talking about scanning an exor- external network or internal network for that matter with Nmap. Uh, the, I'm not gonna get into the details of all the different evasion options because there are a lot of them. Um, there's different options for setting your source Mac, setting different, sp- you can spoof IPs. Um, but the two that I kind of wanted to get into were the timing options and uh, the packet fragmentation, like I just mentioned. There are a few different uh, timing options that will slow down your Nmap scan so that it doesn't send as many requests. And uh, so you have T1, um, which is the sneaky option, which will only wait 15 seconds in between each scan. Or if you're super paranoid, um, you can do T0, which will literally wait five minutes in between each uh, packet. If you're really, really impatient, you can do minus T5, and then it'll get done really quickly. <laughs> yeah. um, but beware, uh, it might melt your network, um, because my home network, like we have done that before, where we've actually sent um, a minus T5 just because I was trying to rush through something, and I wanted the results quick. And, um, and, and you blew something up? <laughs> no, I hear my wife, what are you doing on the network? Because her internet goes down, because she's yeah. on the internet, and there's no... Her computer's uh, melting in yeah. front of her. It's just <laughs> all over the ground. Like the network mess. card is on fire. Yes. From all the packets, <laughs> they're just burning through it. <laughs> um, and then the packet fragmentation option within Map is really helpful as well. So that's just dash F, um, and that will fragment each of the uh, the packets you're um, you're sending. Another thing too is like whenever you're doing an external assessment, uh, you don't need to. I mean, if you're trying to be sneaky, don't just straight up use the default ports. You know, give it just like your typical ports that you would normally find maybe a vulnerable service on. So like look at look at like web services, look at um, maybe like SSH, FTP. Uh, but I mean, we've, we've done a lot of external assessments and I, I have to say like not many times do I find anything other than your typical services anymore. Right, after a certain point, you, you, you have diminishing returns, mm-hmm. right? So um, you're, you're spending your time scanning and resources scanning and then hitting and potentially causing red flags to go up for services that you don't even know what they are, even if you did find them. Mm-hmm. Right? Exactly. So. 
So uh, we're going to get into Proxy Cannon as well. So Proxy Cannon is a tool from Shell Intel that will spin up 20 Amazon EC2, well, up to up to 20 Amazon EC2 instances. So you can spin, as, spin up as little as like five. Um, apparently you can request more. Uh, so you could, you could have more than 20. But the whole point of it is that it spins up a number of instances so that you can proxy your scans through multiple uh, source IPs. So that way, if you're doing a scan against an organization, or if you're doing a, uh, a password spray against an organization, you're hitting, or your, your, your source IP is multiple different source IPs and not just your, you know, the one that you're, you're operating from. The other cool thing with ProxyScan, and it does have this uh, rotate functionality, functionality built in that uh, will allow you to kind of uh, rotate the, the WAN IP of your um, of your Amazon EC2 instance. From what I understand, the way that kind of works is like if you have 10 uh, Amazon EC2 instances set up and you have the rotate option specified, nine of them will continue to function and kind of spread the workload across them while the other one will kind of wait and uh, receive or, or finish, finish whatever requests it was doing and kind of wait until it's kind of idle. And then when it's idle, it will change that, that WAN IP and then kind of be re-implemented back into it. And then the same thing happens to a new one that gets kind of pulled out of the loop. Um, so in, in practice, uh, we've had a few issues with Proxy Cannon, specifically related to uh, issues with it not rotating as much as we kind of would like. Uh, like for example, like I did an assessment recently where I was password spraying like 40,000 accounts and I did it all through Proxy Cannon. And the organization reported that they really only saw like 40 source IPs. And I kind of expected there to be more. I kind of expected it to rotate more. So, you know, take it with kind of like a, you don't know, like a, a grain of salt there that you might have different mileage on how much it actually rotates. Right. Do you know, does, does Proxy Cannon, um, does it reboot the EC2 instance to get the new IP? Because I know like with Amazon, I think on every reboot you get reassigned a new WAN IP. Mm -hmm. Unless you like request for like a elastic IP, which we want one in this case, which is like a static IP. Mm -hmm. Right. Is that what it's doing? Is it spinning down the instances and then re returning? You know I'm actually that? not sure. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know the answer uh, to that. Just look into that. That's yeah. interesting. But there's not, you know, in this in this um, realm of kind of like hiding your source IP, there's really not a whole lot of options. I mean, so like let's say you use Tor, that's probably a bad option because you know Tor is is gonna have um, kind of like a a tainted source or uh, exit node IP anyway that a lot of organizations might block first off. Mm -hmm. So it might kind of be a bad idea just to use Tor. Um, we have a new one, but we haven't disclosed it yet. Yeah, right. <laughs> That'll be in a future episode. We have another. We're working on another tool. We're working on another tool. So, but for now, if you're trying to kind of get around some protections, Proxy Scan is kind of a good option. We're going to kind of demo that real quick. So, uh, you can go grab Proxy Cannon from GitHub. Um, I've got the uh, the um, the URL here. Um, it's it's uh, under Shell Shell Intel scripts directory. So after you get Proxy Cannon, it's basically just a Python script. You're going to need to uh, use pip to install this Boto. Uh, uh, um, Python library. Python library. And after you have that installed, you can uh, use Python to run proxy cannon and with the dash H option will give you the help menu. And you can kind of look through here for different options. Um, like for example, if you wanted to set it to uh, like have it, the EC2 instances hosted in a certain region, you can actually set the region. So instead of like, you know, the US uh, dash East dash one, um, you can set it to like the West or wherever. And then you also have the rotating uh, option here for dash R if you want to rotate the, the host's IPs. Uh, so the next thing you kind of have to do is go get your Amazon uh, ID or keys and secrets, which in my case, um, I'm going to go ahead and just just use them. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to straight up show it. I know it's, it's a terrible thing. Proxy naked. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. All right, so the way you go about doing this is you log into uh, your console at um, console.aws.amazon.com. Click your name. Go to My Security Credentials. Under My Security Credentials, if it'll load, there we go. Come on, internets. <laughs> okay, so uh, under My Security Credentials, your first prompt, do you want to continue uh, to look at your security credentials or set up an IM user? We'll just... Go YOLO and set up a root access key. Boom. <laughs> um, so what, what you have to do here is come in and then create a new access key. 
And so this will prompt you and say, hey, if you don't copy it now, it's not gonna show you it again. So click show access keys and now you have access to my account if you <laughs> copied the key. Um, so what you wanna do is you go copy this because it's your, um, this is this is how ProxyCan is gonna access your account to be able to spin up the various uh, nodes. So I'm gonna go ahead and just copy that to this leaf pad here for a second and then get this out of the way. So uh, what, what's gonna happen whenever you run proxy cannon? It's gonna ask you, oh, actually we need to specify um, how many nodes we wanna spin up first. So in this demo, let's just spin up like five nodes. Um, but like I said, you can spin up to 20 um, under the, the free tier. So the first thing it asks is what is your access key? So let's go grab the access key, copy and paste. And then the next thing is a secret key. Copy and paste. And then after um, after you in in enter your um, ID and key, it's gonna say, do you wanna clear out any existing IP table rules? And then you click yes, go. And now what's gonna happen is ProxyCan is gonna set up a number of IP table rules and kind of route all your traffic through the five EC2 instances that it's gonna spin up. This can take a, a few minutes, so um, let's go ahead and let this set up and we'll cut back to the video in a moment. And we are back. Uh, as you can see, we've got ProxyCanon up and running. It is rotating IPs. And to quickly test that, we can go over to Google and type in what is my IP. And Google will tell you what your public IP is. Um, so you can see we've got 33 or 34.234.63.211. If we run it again, um, we get a different IP address of 174.129.53.226 so on and so forth through your different five uh, EC2 instances that we just set up with the dash R option. Um, so to quickly test this out, what we can do um, additionally is well, we're gonna set up a quick little um, Python HTTP server. So we've got this um, Python HTTP server set up. Let's go hit it with web browser real quick. And we see that test came through. If we go back over to here, we'll see the uh, the public IP of 34231 or 234. So let's go send this to Intruder real quick and have some uh, kind of show how, how it would look from a um, more of like a brute force kind of perspective. Like, so let's say we change this, I don't know, URL maybe. What do you think? Or parameter? Yeah. Give it good. a parameter, like a question or, you know, like ID equals test or something, right? We'll use that as our injection point. Let's go add a payload list. Let's just do something quick, like maybe a quick fuzzing list. <laughs> That's probably actually a really bad. That's a bad one. That's a really bad one. idea. Yeah. Um, here, uh, username is gonna be really long. Let's just do A to Z. Yeah. There we go. Twenty six. All right. So if we go start the attack, come back over here to here, we'll see the different requests, and you can kind of see how proxy cannon. Um, nice. Isn't perfect, right? So you can see how a few few attempts come from the same IP, uh, you know, one after mm -hmm. the other. But you can see how it's kind of rotating through the various uh, servers that you set up. Yeah, the other thing is you only used a handful of them. So right, right. Yeah. So whenever you go through password spraying, the target organization would see something like this. Yeah, very nice. Well, that is it for this edition of Tradecraft Security Weekly. Uh, so one last note for the blue team. When, when I did a recent passwords break against an organization, I, I found that they did a really good job of detecting and alerting on the successes that were happening. So what they were doing is they were basically looking at not just relating to specific IPs, but kind of coordinating multiple failed attempts with successes kind of sprinkled in there. And the successes, they were going and basically just resetting those accounts mm -hmm. immediately. And the last thing, um, you know, if you have like an internal IDS system snored or something, um, you know, go and run inmap with the different fragmentation options. See, see if what you can kind of, I don't know, maybe modify there to view them a little better. Um, you know, test the stuff yourself. Uh, I've got a few, a few resources here for proxy cannon and the different inmap evasion options. Um, you can find us on Twitter. He is you stay ready. Sorry, you're not in the notes okay. here, bud. Forever alone. I know, forever alone. I'll include you next time. That's okay. Thanks for coming over and hanging out with me. Yeah, no problem. Thanks for having me. <laughs> and uh, we'll catch you next week.